part one of criminal justice is going to focus on the nature of crime, criminal law, and criminal justice. Uh, this section is, is broad, uh, and it will be a broad introduction to what is to come. We're going to talk about crime, criminal justice, criminology, and uh, we're going to discuss how the U.S. creates laws in this section. And we're going to talk about the policies enacted to enforce laws. And I also am going to talk about the media's role. I think the media plays a big role. Do you think the media affects the criminal justice system? It's a question I want you to think about. I mean, there's all sorts of cop shows. They've been on TV for decades. Um, movies on Netflix, documentaries on Netflix, that TV show CSI. Do you think that's a real assessment? Of, uh, investigation is what it is, forensic investigation. Chapter one uh, is going to focus on, of this section, chapter one of this section, is going to focus on what I like to say, cops, courts, corrections. It's the justice process and the organization that uh, is entrusted with conducting the operation of the criminal justice system. These three sections we're going to talk about those generally in an overview. In chapters to come, we're going to cover each of them separately in more detail. Chapter two is the nature and extent of crime and attempts to determine why people commit crimes. It's our, kind of our criminology component. And then we're going to talk about criminal law, substance, and procedure in chapter three. So that's all part of part one. So let's jump into chapter one. And Mind you, these are just points. You have the book, you have the chapter. I'm not going to read it to you. I might expand on concepts. I'm going to point to the important concepts. I'll spend a little time there or something that I think they didn't flush out uh, as well. That is what I will do here. I'm hoping to keep these videos uh, short. They are to, be, to accompany your uh, reading materials. This would be as if I was in the classroom. These are the things that I would be talking about. And you have access to my slides. You can download them and use them at the same time you go through this, make some notes on it. And without further ado, let's jump right in. So crimes, they're handled by the criminal justice system. And it doesn't matter how serious that crime could be. It could be a traffic ticket, it could be jaywalking, it could be disorderly conduct, it could be murder, it could be rape, it could be arson. It's handled within the criminal justice system. But what is it? What is the criminal justice system? Law enforcement, right? Our cops, courts, and corrections. Cops are involved with apprehending. Courts are tasked with prosecuting and taking the case through to completion. And corrections is control over or take charge of the uh, defendant or the convicted individual after the fact. Uh, in general, it's a major social institution that is tasked with controlling crime in various ways. That's the general uh, outlook. And the definition of crime, I believe it's in the book, what is crime? This is the definition we're gonna use through this course. It's a violation of laws of society by an individual who are then subject to the laws of that society. And if found, I'm gonna to add to it. I mean, we might have, the crime is a violation of the law of society by an individual who are subject to the laws of society or you know, individual citizens, um, but there is also a penalty for that. And then there's a, a governmental imposed penalty that comes along with that. And who defines crime? The governments, whether it be local, state, or federal, it's going to depend on the law that's involved, but the federal system has laws, and the state system has laws, and our local you know, city ordinances and town uh, ordinances, those are all criminal laws. So I might have jumped my slide a little ahead. Now we're going to delve into uh, the development of the criminal justice system, where it all began. Where did it really all begin? Like the wild, wild west. We had Wyatt Earp, who was shooting down criminals. 
he actually was just a business developer and uh, and then got involved uh, when his town was being taken over by the gang. I think the Cowboys, they made a movie about it, Tombstone, uh, which is a great movie, by the way. But nonetheless, you know, they solved their problems with shooting people, right? Wild, wild west. The first police agencies in the United States were created uh, not until 1838 in Boston and in 1844 in New York and 1854 in Philadelphia. Uh, the first prison or penitentiary, as they called it back in the day, uh, was created to provide a non-physical uh, correctional treatment. They weren't really connected like they are. the system is now. Um, they didn't start working together until 1919 uh, when the Chicago Crime Commission sort of, they were created and their purpose was to keep track of activities of local agencies. And this was a private organization, kind of like a citizen's advocate group. And they're still around today. In uh, 1931, President Hoover appointed a National Commission of Law. Uh, I think uh, National, do I have it on the slide? I don't have it on the slide. National Commission of Law Observance and Enforcement, uh, which makes up the detailed uh, analysis of the criminal justice system today. So that's kind of our foundation of where the criminal justice system has led us today. So now we're going to switch modern era. And you might not be thinking 1950s isn't modern yet, but that's that's where we are. To, that's where we are today. In the 1950s, the American Bar Foundation, uh, which is like a group of lawyers, American Bar Foundation conducted a series of projects uh, analyzing the various administration and organizations and the operation of the criminal justice agencies, and they discovered that some procedures were hidden from the public, and they also noted that. Um, most decisions were being made on personal choice. So, you know, for, for example, that guy's guilty. He just looks guilty. Those kinds of things. Uh, research or, you know, we're going to arrest that person because so-and-so said that they should be and then ultimately punished. Or there was some level of bias that played a role. Uh, the research shifted as to how those three components, our cops and our courts and our corrections could work together. Um, you know, we have the investigation, we have an arrest, we have a prosecution, you know, there's plea discussions that happen, and then ultimately corrections if a person is found guilty or they they plead guilty and then correction steps in and uh either incarcerated they're incarcerated persons incarcerated or this and they're also tasked with any sort of rehab rehab rehabilitation and so at this point is where we coined the whole process the criminal justice process the investigation the arrest the prosecution and off to corrections in 1967, uh, President Johnson and his Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice published its final report, and the goal was to create a comprehensive view of the criminal justice process and make reform recommendations. Uh, in 1968, Safe Streets Act was passed, which provided funds for state and federal crime control efforts. And it, um, the Safe Streets Act was funded, uh, they funded the National Institute of Justice, which is still around today and still encourages research and the development in criminal justice. So there is a lot of funding that comes out of the federal system for not only federal crime enforcement, but also goes to the filters down to the states for enforcement. Another area in our development of the criminal justice system is the evolution of science or evidence-based justice. Forget about, he looks guilty. Uh, now that there was funding and there was a more mature kind of system in place, they were working together, their focus was on a more evidence-based system 
used to use for reform and to develop programs that work or don't work. So what is it? They were using these methods to determine whether programs are reducing crimes and rates of repeat offending. These programs uh, were undergoing rigorous review to see if they were meeting their goals and whether or not there was actually measurable effect on behavior. And a more recent example of this is treatment programs. You may not be familiar with them. You will by the end of probably this chapter, but at least this course. Uh, a treatment court that is a fairly newly evolved, uh, 2005-ish, in some, you know, in, in New York State anyway, in, in other states they might have been a little sooner, some have been a little later. Um, where rather than be convicted of a crime and sent to prison or be incarcerated, if there was an underlying uh, substance abuse issue, an individual can enroll and apply to be part of a treatment program. And it was overseen by and is overseen by courts. And we call those treatment courts. And New York has developed other areas too, mental health court, somebody who has an underlying mental health issue, and also what's called veterans court. If the individual was a veteran and um, maybe there's some underlying issue like PTSD, uh, they would go into a system specifically or a court, yeah, down a court uh, system specifically for veterans. And we'll explore that in a lot more detail in the, in, uh, the court section in this course. And then of course, the, the um, Department of Corrections has uh, similar programs like shock. It's called, they, they have two programs, a shock program and Willard program. These are also rehab uh, based programs where if somebody is incarcerated in prison, uh, they can go through one of these pro uh, programs. One program is six months long, the other one's 90 days, and it's dependent on a number of things. Again, we'll talk about that in more detail, but somebody can then be uh, released earlier than what their sentence would be, and hopefully they have been rehabilitated. Uh, there were some considerations um, taking uh, into account with this evidence-based justice, you know, target audience, you know, are you reaching the right people? You know, a drug program for college students versus the hardcore drug abusers, are we getting the right program in? I mean, I've represented both people, most students who've gotten in trouble here in Plattsburgh, and if there was an underlying substance issue, whether it be alcohol or drugs, you know, a program was always offered to the college student. I would always have to fight to get a, a program for a hardcore drug user in the, in the community. So you want to make sure you get the right target audience, conduct the right experiments. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to click my slide there. A couple more factors, the intervening factors. Do they enhance or impede program success? You know, like a community neighborhood watch. This is a great example from the book, right? A community neighborhood watch might work in high income neighborhoods for kids drinking in a park, but it may be not so much in a high crime area where armed gang members are scaring the residents, right? You got to consider the intervening factors when determining whether such a program works. Uh, the measurements of success, are they realistic? You know, it works for teens, not so much for repeat offenders. Uh, do they you know, retain the program materials? Do they learn from their mistakes? Uh, cost effective, that's another factor that's considered and that it's always considered. God, I don't know why it's listed as number five in the book, it should be number one, because that's always a consideration. Sadly as it is, our local jail had a fantastic uh, program for drug rehab folks who were incarcerated it allowed them to kind of get started and get participating while their case was being worked out and because it was costing too much money it got it got cut and it was sad so um cost effective programs they they work but they the cost is too high and you have to weigh the effectiveness and the efficiency but that's not always the case you should like that's might be a, a, a top cut when there's there's budgets involved 
All right, the contemporary criminal justice system. The justice system basically dispenses formal social control. That is our contemporary justice system. Our criminal justice system components are lodged into and within our three branches of government. Uh, our legislative branch is uh, where you find the lawmakers. That's where our crimes come from. They're making the laws. Our judicial branch, court system, the judiciary. The executive branch is where you find law enforcement. That's where they're covered under. This is in our federal system. This is in our state system and local facilities. You might be, live in a village and they have a village police. Falls under the executive radar. Prosecutors fall under the executive radar. Uh, even though when we talk about them, they're a player in the court system, you're going to find their role teeters between law enforcement and the court system. They kind of are the glue. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that, I'll use the glue, but they kind of are, they're connected. They communicate with law enforcement, should charges be brought, is that the kind of crime we want to, you know, prosecute, versus now we're going to court and I have to take this case from beginning to end. So we'll talk a little bit more about the, about the prosecutors. So our principal components, law enforcement, what do they do? Right, they investigate crimes, they apprehend the suspects, we should also, uh, add here that they are involved with keeping the peace. They should keep the peace. Uh, court agencies, the judiciary, that's where the, the you're arraigned, you may have a trial, and they also deal with the um, imposition for uh, sex offenders. There's another imposition at the end of their term of incarceration where they come back and there has to be a designation of whether they have to register to the public. We'll talk about that in another chapter. And correction agencies, right? They house the inmates, they will monitor them and keep track of their sentence and hopefully rehabilitate them in some way. There are a number of uh, programs, not just the two I mentioned, in the correction facilities that inmates can uh, participate in. This system is massive. It's expensive and it's massive. The book has all the numbers. There's a few of the numbers on the screen. I'm not going to go through each one of them. I'm going to condense it into uh, thinking about it as one person. Let's think about one, one inmate in the Department of Corrections. They have gone through the entire court system, court process. They were, you know, it was investigated, they were arrested, they go through the court system. We're not talking about that expense. There's an expense for that too. What I'm talking about, now they're sentenced and they have to serve some sentence in the Department of Corrections. Let's think about this number, the inmates. One inmate, the median average in the country, the cost to house an inmate for one year is $28,000. In a quarter of our states, it's $40,000. And in New York State, it costs, in 2015, this is the latest number I was able to get my hands on, in 2015, and I'm sure it's slightly higher now, five years later, in New York State, it costs nearly $70,000 a year to house one inmate. And we have well over a million inmates housed here in New York State. so. I'll let you guys do the, do the math on that one. So it's massive and it's expensive. Let's talk about the formal criminal justice process. We're gonna go through it in a lot more detail when we're talking about the cops in section two, we're gonna talk about the courts uh, in section three and in section four, we're gonna talk about corrections. So we're going to expand on these. So there's an initial contact, right? Who's it with? Law enforcement. How does it happen? Someone calls 911, police respond, or the police see a crime happening while they're on patrol. Maybe the police are working with an informant that might tell them of some potential criminal activity that's going on. We know, oh, there's some drug activity that goes on in that house, or, you know, you know this one has storing illegal weapons. Uh, a political figure might initiate an investigation into some criminal enterprise that might be going on. A person may just come in and confess. They walk into the police station like, 
they're overcome with guilt and you know I did such and such so there's initial contact investigation where the law enforcement gathers the evidence they want to identify who the suspect is uh, and get examples of quote-unquote evidence like statements maybe they take photos maybe they find a weapon if a weapon was used you know they might do fingerprints some sort of forensic so oh, pictures there's some blood over here we're dealing with somebody who was uh, seriously injured or murdered so they're tasked with doing an investigation obviously that doesn't work when somebody walks in and confesses but if someone calls 911 they were robbed they call 911 or I should say they were burglarized and the police show up well now they you know they're taking pictures of maybe the door jam was broken and you know they start interviewing the neighbors did you see anything so they have to con conduct the investigation how long do they last it's going to depend on the crime it could be minutes right that's if they watched it happen it's only going to take a few minutes to do the investigation uh it could take years the feds you know when they early on in the 70s when they uh uh, were able to get in at the ground level and act undercover as people working in the uh, mafia families and get it build enough evidence to be able to convict the higher higher ups so it could take years it could take decades the feds take a lot of time uh, their cases they will investigate drug trafficking for at least two three years identity theft sometimes um, so uh, sometimes there's cases that go unsolved. These are primarily murders because they do not have a statute of limitations on them. Statute of limitations, what do I mean by that? It's the time period for which the incident occurred to bring legal action. So um, some cases can run their, run their course, but murder has an open statute of limitations. That's why you see a lot of cold cold cases for murder cases arrest then there's an arrest uh, and in order to make an arrest the police have to have probable cause which means there's sufficient evidence to charge the suspect the defendant slash suspect uh, because what we have when somebody is making an arrest is we have the police de depriving them of their freedom or their liberty and you can't do that under the constitution due process clause so they have to have probable cause or some believable evidence uh, to take them in you don't have to say this is everything we have and they're guilty you just have to have enough and they have to be present this is in present requirement for the defendant uh, even in the covid times everything is happening these kinds of things that we're talking about going forward are happening in the person they're not um in a criminal case the constitution uh is it's a right for individuals to be present at any sort of appearance uh, in a court or anything that involves their criminal case so in pre in person custody someone's detained that's considered custody police bring them in and they slap them in the you know city lockup that's custody what else is the custody when they start questioning them when the law enforcement starts questioning them the question of whether or not they're in custody when you d detain somebody you when law enforcement detains somebody when law enforcement intends to question somebody or if they're going to put them in a lineup you look suspicious you kind of look like the person that the our informant said did a b and c and so you're stuck that person's stuck in a lineup there's all sorts of constitutional protections that come with that we'll talk about it and then there's the charging component so we've already made a few <laughs> few things usually those first few things are happening fairly quickly uh charging the officers believe there's probable cause to exist for a particular charge so they write up the paperwork these are the charges they provide it to the prosecutor they also provide it to the court and the prosecutor side note prosecutor is the one that has the final say in the charge uh, 
they might review the evidence after this process starts going and say, oh, that shouldn't have been a assault in the third degree, which is a misdemeanor in New York. That should have been an assault in the second degree, which is a felony in New York. And it turns on the injury to the person. Was it serious or was it just a physical injury? So the final say on the charge is the prosecutor's job. And then there is the, and we're just, I'm going to stop right here to make one point. Up until now, we've talked about either, either kind of crime. We haven't talked about misdemeanors and felonies, but I'm going to drop it right here briefly. Misdemeanor, you may know, is a lower level criminal charge and a felony is higher for more serious crimes, okay? Up to this point, the process is the same for them both, misdemeanor and felony. The next point I'm gonna make, this preliminary hearing grand jury is only related to felonies. And then we'll jump back in and everything will continue along the same lines. Preliminary hearing slash grand jury. Not every state has this concept of uh, a grand jury. What a grand jury is, it's a panel of people, kind of like a jury, regular jury. They're impaneled, and the feds use this system. New York uses this system. And their responsibility is to determine whether probable cause exists to charge the suspect with the felony charges the prosecutor is seeking. And the prosecutor is the one that presents the evidence, okay? And this is done in secret. The grand jury is done without the knowledge of the suspect sometimes. If the suspect knows about the grand jury or this investigation about them, the prosecutor has to notify them of the um, grand jury date and of the ability that they can come and testify. But the grand jury is, I'm not going to go in huge detail about the grand jury right now. We'll save it for the court system. For right now, we're going to deal with the grand jury as a secret panel of people that the prosecutor have to present ev their evidence to to establish probable cause exists to charge someone with felony charges. And if they vote, yep, you got it, the document is called an indictment. If they, or they also call it a true bill, true bill of indictment. If they say, no, you don't have probable cause, they'll just kick it out and it'll call it, be called no bill. It's a no bill. And then they can say, well, you know what? Maybe that doesn't fit your felony charge, but maybe it fits this misdemeanor charge. And it will um, rule or decide that it should be charged as a misdemeanor. So that's the grand jury process and it's done generally in secret, and the only player there is the prosecutor and his or her witnesses. The preliminary hearing is a little different. This is where the prosecutor will file a document. It's called the information, and it has the charges in it. They file it with the court, and then the court conducts an open hearing. An open hearing, the defendant could be present and can dispute the charges, and their attorney can be there to ask questions and the public can go in and watch and the court will determine whether or not there's probable cause. This is a process that is uh, used in California. We also have a preliminary hearing component, but it also ties in with the grand jury. I'm not going to go into that here, but you need to know the difference between preliminary hearing and the grand jury. And that process is only for a felony. All right, now we jump back in. This is gonna to apply to both misdemeanors and felonies. There's an arraignment. Defendant's now charged. They're brought before a court and the judge reads the charges to the suspect defendant. Now we'll call him a defendant because they're in court. Uh, the judge will tell them what their rights are and this is where a plea gets entered. Not guilty or guilty. Let's assume our defendant said not guilty so we can on to the next process. At that point, the defendant, there will be a discussion with regards to a defendant wanting to um, be detained, not wanting to, but there'll be a discussion of whether or not the defendant should be detained or bail will be set, all right? Um, 
we're going to discuss this in more detail, but the general gist is if the court cassettes bail, we're going to $1,000 bail, the defendant would have to post that in order to remain in the community. If they don't post that bail amount, then they have to, then they're detained until somebody does. The court has the option of just releasing somebody on their, it's called on their own recognizance. The purpose of this bail is to secure somebody's presence in court. It's not supposed to be used as a punishment, it's to secure um, them coming to court. And it's based on several factors, and the factors are usually outlined by a law or a statute. And it's dependent on what the charges are, what the person's ties are to the community, what, you know, their family, their employment, uh, what are the, what's the likelihood of success uh, on the charge, meaning that they can be convicted of the charge. So there's a number of them. So let's say our defendant is out on bail, they posted bail, but then they don't show up to court. One, the court can take the bail, and then they end up with another charge. It's called bail jumping. New York recently went through a entire, maybe you've heard about it because it's getting a lot of uh, attention in uh, earlier this year, the bail reform and uh, discovery rules went into uh, place. But I will speak more about that when we talk about the court system. Then there's a plea bargaining. More than 90% of cases end this way. And sometimes they even happen before arraignment. But they can go from before arraignment, plea, plea bargainings or plea agreements, right up until the time of the jury verdict. You can be in the middle of a trial and the jury's out. And based on what evidence kind of was heard, uh, you know, a plea bargain can be reached all the way up to the point of a jury verdict. Most courts will not take a plea bargain at that point, but it's still available. Trial. Then there's trial or adjudication. If the case doesn't resolve by a plea bargain, you can have a defendant can have a, what's called a bench trial, which is the judge hears the case, or a jury trial. And they have actually have a constitutional right to a jury trial. So if they opt for a bench trial, it has to be done in writing before the court um, on the record showing that the person voluntarily and intelligently waive their right their constitutional right to a jury. Uh, the jury, if it's a misdemeanor case, consists of six people. If it's a felony case, it's 12. The jury must find a defendant unanimously guilty. Beyond a reasonable doubt. We'll talk about that. But what if they don't? What if they don't? Can't make a decision. What happens? It could be a hung jury. If, a decision, if they cannot reach a decision... Ultimately, uh, it's deemed a hung jury. It's the judge to declare it a hung jury. And at that point, the district attorney has to decide whether or not they want to try again. Sentencing. If a defendant is found guilty, the judge has the job of imposing the sentence or disposition in the case. And depending on what the charge is, it could be prison it could be local jail time, it could be a fine, it could be some sort of probation supervision, it could be treatment program. So there's a number of options available at sentencing. And then the appeal process. This is the appeal is primarily for the defendant. If at the end of a trial, the defendant is found guilty, they have an automatic right to appeal the case. The prosecution does not have that option. It's not like they can ask the court saying, oh, this should have been a not guilty plea, or not guilty verdict. They, it's not for the prosecution. Um, the prosecution can appeal during the case. So if the judge makes a decision at some point that could, and it's a serious one, that could ultimately affect what happens, the prosecution can take an appeal at that point and actually everything stops. So the appeal, post-conviction remedies, uh, a defendant can make motions after the fact to the judge saying there was a constitutional violation, 
um, the sentence was wrong, there was an error in law, there's a number of things that a defendant can do to ask the court to revisit on uh, in a motion. They call those post-conviction remedies. And then we have correctional treatment where the person is placed in custody even during their appeal. It could be state prison if it's a state case or a federal prison. The federal prison of bureaus, they call it. Or it's the Department of Corrections in New York and Community Supervision. It's a big, long title, DOCS. Uh, to serve their sentence, the programs they can take part in. They'll have programs so they can get early release or maybe a, a work release or some sort of a rehab. There's educational programs. There's mental health programs. There's a lot of things involved uh, that are available in, in uh, the correction facility. Release. And then when they're done serving their sentence, they're released to society. Um, if they reach their maximum date, they are just released. But if they are released early because they did some sort of program, they'll be placed under some supervision, uh, parole it's called, or post-release supervision. A couple buzzwords in New York State for that. You know, good time helps with that, or merit time. They call it merit time in New York. Some places call it good time. And then there's post uh, release and this is after programs an after program in correctional facilities where it's more of a community correctional facility and uh, we don't have this here the federal system has it where they kind of bridge between release and success into uh, society it's kind of like a connection where they're still being housed but they can go back they can go out into the community to work and that is our overall view of the formal criminal justice process. We will explore it in a lot more detail in um, the third section. And just kind of an overview. There's a diagram in the book, page 1415, that you can review on uh, this issue, the criminal justice assembly line. Uh, as we discussed, we describe each of those stages. Uh, at each one of those stages, decisions are being made. Law enforcement's making certain decisions. The courts and the prosecutors are making certain decisions. And even the defendant has to make certain decisions. But the defendant's decisions are usually at the mercy of the three C's, the cops, the courts, and corrections. And I've heard more than once my clients tell me, is, I don't have no choice in the matter. Well, you do have a choice. You may not like the choices, but... These are the choices. I've also had cops tell me things. Um, the one that stands out, I have a cop told me that when, he, when they are interviewing a person or investigating a person or they have arrested a person and then they wish to interview them and they read them the rights and as soon as they say, I want my lawyer, because that's one of the rights that you have, the cops believe they're guilty just instantly when they quote unquote lawyer up. Uh, you know, I tell you that because not everybody gets through that whole system that I just went through. It's kind of, there's tons and tons of cases. And it's like a, just like my slide says, it's a conveyor belt. It's like, boom, they keep coming in, they keep going out. Prosecutors are busy. You know, we'll talk about the prosecutors and the defense attorneys or public defenders most of the time in the criminal justice process. Um, and they're just funneling through. And the defendant is a lot of times not you know, a whole lot of consideration is being taken care of because a lot of them, like I said, over 90% of the cases, and it's like 98% of the federal cases um, end in plea bargain and not trial. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the FBI spends a lot of time in investigating so they can have a open and shut case in the end. So I leave you with this slide, check out the diagram, and we are going to move on to the next topic.